Well, as we continue with our studies in uh, 1 Samuel, uh, we're going to be looking at the th- chapter 21, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21, and uh, we've learned about uh, how David uh, uh, was on the run. He'd, uh, Jonathan had warned him uh, that Saul wanted him dead and that he was now on the, the run, and so it starts in Verse 1 of chapter 21, David went to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? And David answered Ahimelech the priest, the king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, indeed, women have been kept from us as usual whenever I set out. The men's bodies are holy even on missions that are not holy. How much more? So today, so the priest gave him the consecrated bread since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on that day it was taken away. Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg the Idiomite, Saul's chief shepherd. David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapons because the king's mission was urgent. The priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. It is wrapped in the cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There's no sword here but that one. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. That that day David fled from Saul and went to Ashish, king of Gath. But the servants of Ashish said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands, and David then his ten thousands. David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Ashish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. As she said to his servants, look at that man, uh, look at the man, he is insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen <laughs> that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? I love that bit. <laughs> May God add his blessing to this, his holy word. Fear drives out faith. We know that. Fear drives out faith. But the two are the opposite sides of a coin. Wherever you have faith, this fear is not far away. But when fear drives out faith, it opens the door to the devil. It's in 2 Timothy 1 and 7. It says, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. If fear is knocking, don't open the door. It is so easy to open the door to fear, but it can be one of the hardest doors to shut. David realized that once he had started to lie about the position he had found himself in. This morning we're going to look at David, uh, David's slide in his faith. But we're also going to look how his faith was restored. We're going to look at David's fabrications. We're going to look at David's fear. We're going to look at David's fleeing and David's faith. Four F's for you to remember this morning. It's not a P, but it's an F. So David's fabrications, David's fear, David's fleeing, and David's faith. You see, David ran from the field where he was hiding when Jonathan shouted, hurry, be quick, don't stay. 
Come back, David. <laughs> we hadn't planned that. that he just ran out of the building. <laughs> David was on the run. Saul wanted him dead. And now he was a fugitive. And he heads for Nob, a priestly town not far from Jerusalem. Well, why did David run to this town? Well, we don't know. But maybe he wanted to enlist support from the priests. You see, when we're filled with fear, we want to get as many people on our side as possible. When he meets uh, Ahimelech, the priest is surprised that David's alone. Then David lies to him, saying the king had sent him on a mission and his men were elsewhere. David knew he had to get food and a weapon. So he asked to use the showbread, the consecrated bread. And after continuing the fabrication, he convinced Ahimelech that the men were clean as it was consecrated. This was necessary as the showbread was symbolic of being in the presence of God. God is always present. David was taking matters into his own hands. He'd stopped believing God. So David was full of fear when he noticed this man called Doeg, the Idiomite, who was employed by Saul. He was fearful that Doeg would go back and tell Saul that he'd seen David with the high priest. So David was full of fear. And he asked Ahimelech if he, would, if he had a weapon so he could defend himself. And of course, he gets offered Goliath's sword. Do you see the irony of where David has slipped to? If you remember what happened on that field when David was just a young man, a young boy really, and he'd come to uh, bring a packed lunch to his brothers. And he'd heard Goliath uh, shouting the odds against God. And David took on Goliath. And when he did so, he was trusting in God. And he said to this Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. David went up against Goliath, not in his own strength, because he had no strength. He went up to, against Goliath in faith, believing that God was with him. And if God is with me, who can be against me? This was David's high point. And now we see, as he's asking for the sword of Goliath to defend himself, rather than God defending him, he's at his lowest point, lying to a priest, trying to defend himself, fearful. And now he opened the door to the devil. So David flees. He flees Nob, and where does he run to? Gath. This is the enemy city. It was a major city of the Philistines. And when we're filled with fear, when Satan is calling the shots, where do we run to? David ran directly to his enemy. We start to listen to the lies of the devil. When we slip in our faith, we move into enemy territory. We maybe don't appreciate it, but that's why togetherness is important. What had happened to David? He was alone. He hadn't got people around him who was going to help him. He was alone. And that's why it's so difficult if in, in, in our church environment... If we're separated out from the body of Christ, if we're separated out from the, the, the gathered community of believers, we're at great risk. 
And it could be fear that drives us out. And then the devil starts telling us lies. And then you become isolated. And before you know it, you're in enemy territory. He went to Ashish, king of Gath. But he was recognized. Not surprising, is it? When he'd been fighting the Philistines all these years. When it was... <laughs> I don't think he even... Uh, well, he'd obviously grown a beard because he dribbled in his beard. But uh, He went to there after destroying Goliath and he, uh, winning many battles against the Philistines. Again, fearing for his life, David feigns insanity, dribbling in his beard and acting like a madman. And in fact, he did such a good job that Ashish thinks he is mad and asks, why have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen? I've got plenty. <laughs> why bring me another? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> Can you imagine everybody in his court standing there going, One step forward for the madmen. And everybody goes. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get to David's faith. For us to get a handle on David, we need to turn to Psalm 56. This, it, this has been written uh, when the Philistines had seized him, at, uh, David at Gath. And David cries out and this is a turning point and this is this is important to, to realize that this is a turning point from his fabrications from his lies from his slipping from faith from his allowing fear in and driving faith out uh, to coming to that point where he's fleed into enemy territory he's at his lowest ebb he's feigning madness to try and get away he's at his he's at the pit be merciful to me, O God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit all day long. They press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride, many are attacking me. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? All day long they twist my words. All their schemes are for my ruin. They conspire, they lurk, they watch my steps, hoping to take my life. Because of their wickedness, do not let them escape. In your anger, God, bring the nations down. Record my misery. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. By this I will know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust and I'm not afraid. What can man do to me? I am under vows to you, my God. I will present my thank offering to you. For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling that I may walk before God in the light of life. Do you see the turning point in David? He was lying. He was on the run. He was fearful. He went into enemy territory. He's acting like a madman to get away. And he comes to the point when he comes to, to you know, as the, as the prodigal son came to his own mind, he, he, he suddenly had a clarity of vision. I need God. Have you been at that point where you, you have to cry out and say, God, please, I need you. Help. One of my favorite prayers is, God, help me. Not a big prayer. And it's usually from the heart. Be gracious to me, O oh God, for man tramples on me. I trust in God. I shall not be afraid. 
You see, when we move from fear to faith, fear disappears. When we put our trust in God, when we get into God's presence, we know that we are his. David was back believing in God, and he had to go to the depths before he could call out to God. And God hears his cry. If you're fearful about a situation, if you're frightened about what the future holds, if, you're, if you feel as though you're slipping away from God, then here are five tips to help you eliminate the poisonous thoughts that will rob you of the victorious life you desire to live. The devil shoots fiery darts. We know that. But you need to extinguish them with the shield of faith. Now, what they did in olden times is they would soak, the, the, the shields would be covered in leather, and they would be soaked in water. So if a fiery dart came, it would be extinguished by the shield. If the devil is putting poisonous thoughts in your mind, you need to do, follow this, these steps to give you the victorious life, to give you the victory over him. Step number one, believe in God's promise. In Psalm 91, 11, it says, he orders his angels to guard you wherever you go. God sends his angels to intervene in our lives. There are more angels working for us than demons are against us. David needed to believe he was in God's presence and his promise was that he would be king. No harm could befall him as God's promises always come true. You know, we think of the promise to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations and yet he said, sacrifice Isaac. He had to have faith to believe that God had it covered because God had promised. He had to believe the promise. Begin to speak the word. There's nothing stronger to combat the spirit of fear than to speak the word of God. Fill your heart with God's promises of provision and protection. Write scripture down on a sheet of paper and speak it out loudly every day until you believe it. Put it on your shaving mirror. Who's done that, by the way? No? <laughs> well, I was just looking at Janice. <laughs> so, no. Put it on your wardrobe door. Put, it, you know, put scripture in front of you so that you can read it and speak it. Do you know what? what's really exciting? If you're down in the dumps and you're under attack and you know you're under attack, is read scripture aloud. It's amazing what it does. Just stand and read it aloud. Standing's good to read scripture and read it aloud. In Psalm 56, 4, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Third step, Know that God brings his word to pass. In Jeremiah 1.12, it says, I'm watching over my word to perform it. Everything God has spoken concerning you is carefully being attended to by God. He will keep his promises and he will bring his word to pass. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise. Step four, say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Satan uses fear as a weapon. All day long they uh, injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will, uh, they will escape. In wrath cast down the people, O oh God. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for 
me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. If the enemy's weapons attack us, our faith can protect us. This was something David learned. Expect good things to happen to you and your family. Whether you realize it or not, it takes the same amount of energy to believe good things are coming your way as it to believe that bad things are going to happen. Begin each day to focus your thoughts on the energy on God and your energy on God's goodness. Romans 8 and 28, all things work to be all there is the good and the bad. All things work together for good according to God's purposes for those that love him. You see, we need to realize that God is sovereign over everything. He's sovereign over evil, and he uses it for good. We saw that in the life of Joseph. I will send my energy. If I, if I say to myself, I will send my energy, spend my energy on thinking and expecting good things to happen, and not evil. So when fear comes knocking at your door, go into your heart where you've hidden the word of God and send faith to answer the door. Don't let fear in, but combat it in faith. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word this morning. May it be a word in season. Uh, maybe there are people here this morning who are fearful, fearful about their circumstances, fearful about the future, uh, fearful about uh, people who have been uh, awkward or difficult uh, around them, fearful about our economy, fearful about our finances, uh, with the energy prices going up, uh, it's easy every time you turn the news on, it's gone up another thousand pounds. Uh, it is easy to become fearful. And so, let, Lord, as we recognize that we can be full of fear, help us to cast our burden to you. Help us turn to you and to trust in you. That we cry out, uh, my, be merciful to me, my God. Be merciful to me, my God. Be merciful to me, my God and to realize that he's there present with us, and he will protect us, and he will uh, bring all the things that are happening uh, to good, because we love him, and we are called according to his purposes. And so, Lord, hear our hearts cry as we re-engage with you to know that we are the children of the living God, and that you will be there for us, no matter the circumstances, no matter the difficulties. For we trust in you and you are faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.